welcome, welcome. This is a not Friday fireside chat <laughs> with Jennifer Aker and Naomi Bagdonas. Uh, I'm Rita McGrath. Um, as we are having people joining, uh, let me remind you this is being recorded. So as I like to say, do not say anything or put anything in the chat. You do want not want your mother or the New York Times being able to access afterwards. <laughs> um, and, uh, we're, uh, we're hopefully going to have a delightful time talking about their new book. Just a couple of words of introduction about my guests. Um, so Jennifer Aker is a professor of, I think it's organizational behavior, is it Dobie? I'm a behavioral scientist. I live in the marketing group, but most of my work relates more to organizational okay, behavior right. than it does. Yes. Well, it wasn't that far off then. Yes, uh, you're very you're close. There, uh, for those of you that are not in the know, like we're incredibly territorial about our academic department. So <laughs> I wanted to make sure I got back that. Back away, right. back away from marketing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Naomi Bagdonis, among other things, is a consultant, a lecturer. Both of them hang out at Stanford. Um, so those of us on the East Coast get incredible sunshine envy right about February. <laughs> that sets in. <laughs> and we're here to talk about their new book, which is Humor Seriously, uh, spelled with or without an appended U, depending on what part of the world that you're in. Uh, it's out in the UK, been getting rave reviews, really, really very popularly uh, accepted by in esteemed places like the FT and so forth, but we have to wait for it. So the good news is we can pre-order it and you guys have some goodies to go together with pre-orders for those of us in the States, right? So we'll get to that uh, in a bit. So we'll, we'll save the shameless promotion for a little bit later, but <laughs> I thought um, to get started, it would be just great to talk about um, firstly the humor cliff, which was the first time I became aware of your work, which is, you know, that as we get older, like the joy just sort of erades out of our lives and we end up spending our time with PowerPoints and Excel spreadsheets and not, <laughs> not, not having fun. So maybe just comment on that, whoever would like to take that one. Sure, um, I'll jump in. So the humor cliff is fascinating because it's such a large data set. It was a data set that was collected by Gallup that Naomi and I got access to a few years back. And what Gallup did was just ask individuals um, across cultures, 166 countries, uh, 1.4 million people, did you smile or laugh yesterday? And the answer is yes, when people are 16 and 18 and 20, and all of a sudden it becomes starkly no around 23-ish when people enter the workforce. And it doesn't actually increase um, till around sort of 60, 70, 80, like when people retire. And so those are 47 all too serious years. Um, what's also important to know is that, you know, the average four-year-old laughs about 300 times per day. That was my headset falling out. A four-year-old would have found that to be hilarious. <laughs> um, but it takes an average 40-year-old about two and a half months to laugh that, that frequently. Rita, I've known you for a while. You are not your average 40-year-old. Um, you're more like, you know, let's call it a 16 year old in terms of the number of times you laugh. But the, you know, another way to look at that is that, you know, 75, 40 year olds put together, which could be, you know, the entire staff of a medium to large size um, law firm are getting out laughed by essentially toddlers, um, which is devastating knowing, you know, basically the neurological and health benefits that laughter and levity bring, not to mention the work benefits. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I thought one of the things I found most interesting um, about sort of your coming to this topic, because it's not, it is not the topic that I mean, those of us that are serious academic professionals who put footnotes on everything uh, no, would normally entertain as a first point of entry into, you know, uh, a way of thinking. Um, but you talk about um, an, uh, Amit Gupta, which I think is a nice way to sort of illustrate why this topic is just so compelling uh, it, it, about the book. So tell us his story. Yeah, absolutely. So Naomi and I came into this process of both teaching these classes and also writing this book in very different ways. Um, but I never really took, you know, humor seriously. I, um, you know, as an academic, we are, <laughs> you're trained to basically dive into research to test your hypotheses. Uh, it's not necessarily a levity filled activity. It's a more introverted activity. You know, you go deep 
Um, you collect data, you analyze the data, you write it up, you know, 10 people will read your um, wonderful paper. If it's as, a, as a friend of mine once said, um, when there was some research that got reported about the average number of people who would read an article in say, in my field, it would be administrative science quarterly, right? It's very, very you know, very good publication. And he said to me, you know, if I knew who they were, I would address them by name. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Submitted the paper. <laughs> Dear Naomi, Rita, and Missy. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for reading my paper in JCR. Um, <laughs> and so, but what had happened was, I think, you know, like a lot of academics, certainly I went through a point, which is, you know, what really is my impact in the world? Mm -hmm. um, besides, you know, the three of you guys reading at JCR. And, um, and so what I did about seven, eight years ago with my husband, I wrote this book called Dragonfly Effect, which was, I'm about harnessing the power of story and social networks to make positive change in the world. And we ended up working with about 17 families during that year to see if we could help find a match in the bone marrow registry for them, or when there wasn't a match, find one by running these bone marrow drives. And we worked with these 17 families, most of whom were, had kids that had leukemia. Uh, one of the people we worked with was Amit Gupta, who you just mentioned. And what was fascinating about working with Amit Gupta, who is an entrepreneur uh, in San Francisco, uh, was that when he was diagnosed with leukemia and didn't have a match in the bone marrow registry, he uniquely set forth on the path of trying to find a match using humor. As an entrepreneur and as a human, he always used humor. And so when he was diagnosed with leukemia, it was very authentic for him and his friends to actually tackle that very serious challenge with, with a dose of levity. So for example, he and his family and friends would you know, run these swab parties in New York bars where guests were invited to BYOSA, which is bring your own South Asian. Um, and then they would get comedians to make a give a spit about cancer, PSA. And in that process, he found a match. And so as I was party to this and witnessing him while confronting his own ment you know, mortality, the way that he cultivated this culture of levity to draw others to him and mobilize them was just jaw dropping. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I really had the wrong view, I think, of humor and that, you know, basically, instead of it being tangential, it was actually critical to what he, his friends and our students were trying to do. Um, and, and that's what's sort of jump-started me on this path of understanding the science of, of humor and being interested in it. It's cool. But Naomi, you got there first, right? Well, sort of. I got there first and then I totally lost my way. So, <laughs> um, so I, my background is I was doing strategy consulting by day and uh, working in this group that designed and facilitated workshops for boards and groups of executives. And then by night I was doing improv comedy. So I was going to shows, I was performing and these two worlds lived completely separately. You know, in my mind, I thought, you know, my comedians are gonna look at my professional experience and say, you're crazy and wasting your mind. And my professional colleagues, you know, uh, would say the exact same. And so it got to- I love the idea that spending time with corporate boards would be considered a complete waste of your time. I think that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, absolutely. They're like, are you, so you just talk in jargon all day and that's what you do. And you think that's what it's, I mean, I just, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't really share that part of myself on either, in either side. And I had two realizations. The first was this really stark realization that I was humorless and pretty personality -less at work that I was burning out and that people viewed me as sort of this, um, strategy bot. And I was a really good strategy bot, but I was not a very personable strategy bot. And then the second realization was that humor could be really powerful for me, especially as a relatively young woman in a career and normally surrounded by people who are more senior than me. Um, and in many cases, more male than me, um, that I had a couple of moments where humor slipped out and I realized, oh my gosh, this is actually gaining me status and power. And I can use this as a tool. That's great. I mean, one of the things I know with women and one of the, my side gigs is I run a program called Women in Leadership. And one of the things we always talk about is how women have in many, well, any, any low power group, it could be female, it could be other, um, you know, underrepresented groups, um, but they have a low 
lower latitude of power that they get to exercise. And so I, I tell a story about a joke that my very senior, very esteemed and accomplished um, dissertation advisor would tell. And he used to tell this joke about the invention of business class, you know, and how great it was and how it was profitable for the airlines. And he'd wrap up by saying, and I've tried many times with gusto to make up the difference in price in free drinks, right? And everybody would laugh and that would be great. And if I told that joke that way, I mean, you'd be horrified. You'd be like, oh my God, is she okay? Like, <laughs> so, so I had to modify the joke, right? And it was, uh, so the way I tell it is, uh, oh, and I have, I'm, I'm here to tell you, my husband has tried many times to make up the difference in free drinks and it's not a pretty sight. And everybody's like, great, no problem, right? But I think that is interesting. Um, and uh, just, just how that kind of works. So our listeners are hungry for an example of how humor had that effect for you, Naomi? Sure. Absolutely. So I was one example that comes to mind is uh, relatively early in my career. So I was mid twenties and I was um, taking this stretch role. So I was facilitating a group dynamic session for a board and the most senior person in the room, a man named Craig was um, he was really sort of status um, demonstrating a lot. So his hands were behind his head. He was leaned back in his chair and I, um, and I noticed that he was pretty disengaged and w- and the comments he made were a little bit flippant. So I'm standing at the front of the room, everyone else is sitting, I'm giving my presentation. And about halfway through, when I'm talking about um, using, basically how do you use empathy to read people's emotions and therefore connect with them more powerfully? He interrupts me and he says, can you cut to the part where you just get my people, you get my people to do what I want without me having to tell them all the time. And it was this moment, like the oxygen left the room, right? And here I am standing at the front of the room. Everyone swivels their head to him, swivels their head back to me. And without thinking, I'd been doing improv in, you know, in the nights. And without thinking, I just shot back at him. Craig, that's a great question. You're thinking about the session I run on mind control and come back next week and I'll teach you all about that. And it was a, I mean, at the moment, it was a bold move by me. As soon as I said it, I thought, oh my gosh, I've just totally, you know, I've ruined my career talking back to this guy. And instead what happened was there was this moment of pause and then the room erupted in laughter and Craig himself erupted in laughter. And I'm going to use, this is the best story to use because of what he said. So everyone laughs and he looks at me and he goes, I respect you. You can continue. (laughs) Word for word. I wrote it down in my notebook later. I was like, Oh my gosh this can be a tool for me. And, you know, and I, and I detail in the book, this actually became a really important moment for me. He reached out to my CEO. He told my CEO about how powerful my session had been. And he became a, an advocate for me after that. That's, that's a great story. That's a yeah. great story. But it is funny how sometimes those moments, um, like, like they sort of slip out of you before you knew what to expect almost, <laughs> which totally. is interesting. Oh yeah. So um, you've had um, the, the, in the book, you talk about four humor styles, which I think is interesting because I think when you tell people try to be a little more human, try to be more empathetic, you know, and you get these people, like one CEO I knew was what we would call a reflector. Like he, he, and he had, unfortunately he had these like huge round glasses. And when he went, go into like a reflection mode, he was like the Cheshire cat. Like he completely disappeared behind these glasses. And one of his heads of strategy was designing this offsite retreat. And I was doing some work with them at the time. And she said, I know what we'll do. We'll have a room full of young people and they'll rapid fire pepper him with questions. And it'll be this really engaging give and take. And I was like, no, 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 we're we're not going there. Don't do it. I had strong, like, like, don't do it. Just don't like what you want to do is get a stack of index cards, write the questions out in advance, give it, give them to him 48 hours ahead, let him cogitate on them. And then you can have a great session. Well, did she listen to me? Of course not. (laughs) So so we're in this session and like the first questions gets asked and you can probably relate to this, right? The guy disappears like metaphorically just disappears behind his, again, he thoughtfully thinks about the question, then gives his measured response, by which time all the people who are more kind of activist in the room, you you know, are are desperately looking for the exits. I mean, it was bad. (laughs) Anyway, talk about the four styles. That would be fun. Absolutely. So one of them is stand up, which you kind of did a little bit right there. That tends to be more extroverted, you know, sort of easy to laugh. They're natural entertainers. They're not always um, 
afraid to ruffle a few feathers. Um, the second type, which you also are, is magnet. And they they are actually, they keep things positive, warm, and uplifting. They avoid controversial or upsetting humor while radiating charisma. And then there's the sniper. The snipers are edgy and sarcastic and nuanced, and they're unafraid to cross a line to get a laugh. And then there's sweethearts, and they tend to be more earnest and honest. And their, their humor often flies under the radar because they often like read the room and know, you know, what are the risks associated with humor. So we never use humor, you know, basically to, you know, um, if there was a risk associated with it. So what we find is that people have like a primary and a secondary style. Mm -hmm. And we also find that it tends to be pretty different at work. Um, versus at home or, you know, some, some of these styles differ with very close friends versus colleagues. So what, first of all, do you agree with our self-assessment of you or our assessment of you? And um, two, are you different, Rita, in different contexts or no? Oh, you're asking me? Yes. Um, self-assessment, I, ha I had read it and I, I kind of stuck myself primarily in magnet with, 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 as you said, with glimpses of stand-up. Um, when I'm feeling cowardly, definitely, sweetheart, definitely, like, 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 <laughs> you know, I need to be talked out of that sometimes, because uh, I don't think it serves well. Um, so that's what I put myself and what, what was I'm sorry, what was the second question? It was, does it differ like when you're with your, oh, yeah. your family, your kids, etc, versus at work? I actually got assessed on this and um, and my colleague, uh, Paul Ingram, you may know him, he, he did this assessment and he says to me, well, if you weren't doing what you're doing now, you would either be a politician uh, or an actor. <laughs> so yeah, I like I'm way out on that, on that dimension. <laughs> so are there mistakes when you try to apply one style to another um, setting? Absolutely. So this is one of the most powerful things about understanding your style is recognizing that we think of our sense of humor as something that we carry with us no matter where we go, right? I have the same sense of humor here than I do at work, than I do at the improv stage. And what we find is that um, not only do people's styles shift and that's okay, but that's actually really good and healthy for us as professionals. So one example of this is different styles of humor are going to work for people, whether they're lower status in an environment or higher status in an environment. So when you are lower in status, humor that is more observational, even a little bit more biting, um, you know, less self-deprecation is going to work well. And in fact, if you're lower in status, self-deprecation can take away your power. What we find is that once people get more senior, that's when self-deprecation actually becomes a superpower. So giving a window into your humanity, into some of your vulnerability is actually a way to gain status and power. And there, are, of course, there are all of these other um, uh, examples of that as well. But personally, for me, I'll give an example. So when I'm teaching in the classroom at Stanford, you know, at the GSB, our MBAs in that context, right, are, quote, lower status than me. I'm the highest status person in the room. Along with Jennifer, we are there to impart wisdom, right? We're there to teach. We're there to challenge. Totally. Uh, Sage on the stage. Bring it I, on. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so in that situation, I want to lean on magnet and sweetheart style humor. And I made a mistake early in teaching where I sort of digged into one of my students and it really didn't go well. You could feel like the whole blob, the whole um, community of students sort of crossing their arms and going, don't treat us that way, right? Um, but when I am facilitating a board retreat and I am, again, sometimes the youngest person in the room or you know, there's other status differentials, I'm gonna lean into my stand-up and sniper style humor like I did with Craig. Mm -hmm. And that style of humor is gonna be more effective for me than the kind of self-deprecation that's gonna work in the classroom. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. That's very cool. So people can assess themselves, right? You've got to wait for them to do that. They so can, yeah. So they can go to humorseriously.com and in the upper right, you can click on the quiz and uh, find out what your style is. Oh, that's fun. Using data. <laughs> you had to add that, right? <laughs> so, um, I mean, I think a lot of business people, if, and I think partly because of this humor cliff indoctrination we've had, they just don't feel comfortable. They feel like I'm not naturally funny. I don't tell jokes. I'm not whatever, you know, I'm just whatever Joe from finance. Um, so where should they start? Where, where, where would you advise them to get going? 
Well, first of all, it's, a, you know, part of it is just like debunking these misperceptions. Um, so, you know, one is, you know, that humor just is like about being a stand up and being funny. It's about, you know, comedy. And this isn't, this isn't about, you know, basically, you know, a, a comedy or being a stand up. It's about A, understanding your own authentic humor style. And then B, um, it's about looking for these moments in our day to day and in our work for a moment to diffuse tension, to use levity, or even just like do a simple callback. So for example, one of the easiest um, sort of tools that comedians often use is um, wait for a first laugh in a meeting or whatever. And then later in the meeting, reference that exact moment that created the, the laugh line. And you're doing two things in a work context. One, you're making that person who you referenced by having this call back to that laugh line, you know, feel good because that person was heard. And the second is that you're, you're creating a secondary moment for joint or shared laughter um, with very little risk because you've already called back to it. Mm -hmm. And we know that individuals, when there's a shared moment of laughter, um, studies show that people report to be 30% closer and kind of uh, increased levels of trust happen after that shared moment of laughter. Mm -hmm. And so what you're doing is not just diffusing tension in ways that are completely basically riskless, but you're also changing the conversation and the way that people are interacting with each other. So that's one, one way to start thinking about it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also, I think, um, uh, sorry, go ahead, Naomi. Oh, I was going to say, because Maggie and others love tangible examples, I'll give an example that happened just yesterday of a callback, because these are so easy to do. All you do is listen. So I was on a call with a group of CFOs and, um, you know, everyone went around and did their introductions before the panel discussion began. And one woman said, um, I'm a, um, I'm a recovering CFO. So she was retired and everyone laughed. So then, you know, five people later, someone else said, I'm also a recovering CFO and everyone burst into laughter. And then, you know, five or six people later, someone said, I'm an aspiring recovering CFO. <laughs> these little things, you just uh -huh. listen for a moment of laughter and you just jot it down and say, how do I bring back that moment? Cause mm -hmm. it's going to create community. It's going to make me look good. And it's going to create an environment where people are feel safer, feel more comfortable, and we can ultimately be more productive. Right. And so for those of us, those of us listening who are still skeptical, um, there's a neuroscience to this, right? So humor creates bonds. It makes you feel more trusting. It creates psychological safety. I mean, there's a whole litany of things you go through in the book. So give us like the pitch on that for those that are still, still a little skeptical. Okay, so for those skeptical, get this. <laughs> when you laugh, your brains release a cocktail of hormones. You release dopamine, you release endo endorphins, you release oxytocin, your cortisol goes down. And so what's really important here, and there are behavioral implications for all of these. So when your cortisol is lower, you make bolder choices, you, your fight or flight is, is repressed, you're able to be more creative, you're able to access higher order thinking. When you release oxytocin, you are more trusting of people, you create connections, you, um, you, you know, feel a stronger sense of community. When, you're, uh, when dopamine kicks in, you remember things more. Uh, you have a little, a little pleasure hit, so you think, oh, I wanna listen to that more. Um, what's really important here is the recognition that this is not just psychology, this is biology. Mm. So this is our brains are changing when we laugh. And we think about humor as being sort of this fun, frivolous thing. We don't think of it as a way to fundamentally change our biology and therefore make us more resilient to difficult times, more trusting of the people around us, more creative um, in the face of, of change, and even more confident and feel more powerful. But, but this is really what's happening in our brains and to our bodies. Mm -hmm. And it also is connected to, as you said, resilience, but even managing really difficult situations. And you were talking about you know, stories about the Holocaust or stories about, I mean, people in really in extremist situations using humor as a way of, of coping, I guess, um, you know, and getting past it and getting some mastery over the situation, I guess I would say. Absolutely. 
Yep. There's a, actually a study done by Dacher Keltner and his colleagues where he asked um, individuals who um, had a deceased, uh, who had a recently deceased partner. So their partner died. Um, and those individuals that kind of spontaneously mentioned moments of humor and laughter recovered from the death much more quickly. They had reduced levels of stress that um, lasted and they um, were able to appreciate the life that they had to a greater degree. And you even see that, you know, with, you know, Victor Frankl, um, I don't know if you read, you know, the, the man's search for meaning, but, you know, he talked a lot about, you know, the importance of humor and how to persevere through the darkest of times and what it means to live in, in the presence of, of humor. And he had this great quote that, um, you know, basically said, you know, he was training with a friend in um, a, a concentration camp and they were working on a building site and, um, the friend was saying like the most important thing is to develop a sense of humor. And so he suggested to the friend that they would promise to each other to invent at least one amusing story each day about some incident that could happen one day after their liberation. And so um, even just planning moments of humor or amusement had this disproportionate impact on his psychology and mindset. Wow, that is brilliant. That is really, well, there's a lot of work been done, humor aside, on, on the science of actually visualizing, um, you know, activity. And I'm trying to remember now who I heard this from, but, but the mental act of pretending you went and exercised actually has beneficial physical effects as if you were actually exercising, things like that. And I think humor really comes into that very, very nicely. Yeah. Um, so one of the, the, again, back to converting the skeptics here, um, you tell a great story from the Bush administration about tan socks. And if I had thought tan socks would be something that would appear, you know, as a bonding experience, I never would have believed it. So maybe that would be an interesting story to just recall. Sure. So, um, so this is a story that was told to us by um, Keith Hennessy, who is a leading economic advisor to President George W. Bush. And, you know, he, we love talking to Keith because you find out that inside, you know, some of the most high stakes moments there's, that's where you'll find pranks and humor and a whole lot of levity. So this one story was, it was 2005 and um, Ben Bernanke, it was his first day on the job as the chairman of President Bush's Council of Economic Advisors. So obviously- He doesn't strike you as a yuck it up kind of guy, Ben Bernanke. No, no, he does not. <laughs> no, he does not. And, um, and tends to be more introverted as well. So he came into the Oval Office. It was his first um, briefing with the president. And it was a high stakes moment for him, right? The president was there, Vice President Dick Cheney, um, Carl Rove was there. Uh, it was a, an important moment, right? His moment to, to leave a good first impression. So as he was sitting down, he, he began his presentation and President Bush interrupted him and said, hold on a minute, Ben, are you wearing a dark gray suit with tan socks? And it was sort of this moment, everyone laughed but Ben Bernanke actually got pretty flustered by it. And so he went through the rest of the presentation, but he was feeling a little flustered. So um, Keith Hennessy and a couple of the other advisors circled up afterwards and they said, okay, we got to figure out a way to make Ben feel part of the team, right? He had this moment, he was flustered. So how do we sort of get back at President Bush and also make, uh, you know, make Bernanke feel good about it? So they concocted this master plan. And the next time that Ben Bernanke was going into the Oval Office to do his briefing a couple weeks later, the same cast of characters was convened in the semicircle again. And uh, Ben Bernanke once again sat down. He opened his notebook to uh, start to give the briefing. And just as he was about to begin, everyone in the room crossed their legs and their pants came up to reveal that they were all wearing tan socks. And so President Bush, looked around, everyone started laughing except for Bush. He looks around and he looks at Dick Cheney and he goes, Dick, can you believe these guys? And mid-sentence, he looks down to realize that Dick Cheney is also wearing tan socks and the room just erupts in laughter. Um, and you know, it feels like such a, a trivial thing, but when Keith was telling us about it, he was saying, you know, it was this wonderful bonding moment that here we are, the president, all of his advisors together, and we're sharing this little moment of joviality that, lend, that then seeps into the way that we're able to collaborate together as a team. And much more trusting. Absolutely. Much more trusting. 
Absolutely. Very, very interesting. Um, so one of the things you you talked about, um, one of the great examples, I think, is Leslie Blodgett, a friend of ours, and uh, um, just recently wrote a best-selling, uh, I think, Wall Street Journal bestseller book, Pretty Good Advice, um, and how she used humor to get her business going, which I thought was was kind of interesting, you know? Yeah, absolutely. All of the leaders we profile from, you know, Sarah Blakely to Secretary Albright to Leslie and other men as well, um, they, it's, humor comes really authentically oftentimes, but in other cases, um, they're not the ones using humor. They're actually supporting this culture of levity in really interesting ways. Leslie falls into that camp of using it naturally. She believes humor is like oxygen for her. She's incredibly generous with laughter, but one of our favorite stories is when um, it was, I, well, first of all, it's also important to note, she is the humor CEO ambassador of our class, which means she comes into the class every single year and oh, yeah. basically mentors you know, students because they really need to have a, a very concrete example of someone who really truly is doing this, you know, in order to debunk, again, all of those cynics. <laughs> so, but this particular story, it was, you know, um, I think in 2006, um, she sold her company, um, no, 2006, basically, she was basically just, you know, increasing sales, she had this incredible word of mouth going for her with her company called Bear Essentials and Bear Minerals, she was its founder. Uh, But in 2009, the business slowed during one of the worst economic recessions, you know, that we've experienced um, in US history. And as Leslie put it, you know, she's like, I want to basically um, help women feel beautiful at a moment in time, which is very ugly. (laughs) You know, the economy was dark. So what she decided to do was take out a full page um, in the New York Times at, um, and she took out this ad. There's no PR. There's no branding. She basically wrote it herself. And Rita, you know her. Like, this is what she does. She just, like, takes out a little diary and she starts writing. And she basically started this with, like, you know, the advertising experts tell us that people don't read a lot of copy. I really hope not because this cost a fortune. And then she talks about the products and her love for the customers. And then she ends with, thanks for reading this long thing. My husband was convinced you would not read this and he's not even an ad exec. And if you're ever in San Francisco, give me a call. We can have a cup of coffee. I'm not kidding. Call our main office at blank, blank, blank. Generally, Hilda answers the phone. Lots of love, Leslie, XOXO. So what happened? First of all, like people couldn't believe that they could actually call her. Um, So not only did sales skyrocket right after that ad, but Hilda, who was in the office lobby, so everyone passing by could hear how many times she was answering the phone, booking her for coffee, you know, basically felt like a hero. And that's what we find with a lot of our leaders is that it's not about them all the time. It's about finding someone who maybe wasn't seen and making them the hero as well with you. And so it's like creating this story that you're starting to live together and the team bonds morale shot up during the recession. Um, And, you know, Leslie was caffeinated for a very long period of time. I can imagine. <laughs> That's such a, such a great story. So let's um, let's talk about leadership now, because I think this is this um, quality that I think is often really badly misunderstood. So, you know, in 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 times that are more stable, let's say, or in times of of um, threat, right? We have this image of you know the leaders at the front of the cavalry on a white horse brandishing a sword and they're gonna tell everybody what to do and you know do this, do this, do this. And then you know the related theory of bureaucracy, right, is that you break every organizational task into component parts and and each person sort of in the hierarchy knows what their part is, but they don't know anything else. And so the only place it all comes together is at the top. And I think both of those characterizations of leadership presume things that just aren't true. (laughs) So the first thing they presume is that knowledge actually flows upward. In my experience, it does not. Uh, And they presume that you know enough about the surrounding context to be able to tell people what to do in an effective way. And so one of the things I think we're transitioning toward in our view of what leader, what good leadership is, is much more about getting information, asking questions, observing what's going on. And I think to some extent using humor in a skillful way. Um, to to make a point or or whatever, so I'd just be interested in your reflections on on how you've seen attitudes towards leadership shift. What what really effective leaders are doing, and I think that 
you know, raising up the people that work with you is is key. I mean, I think that's a really valuable lesson to take out of this. Yeah, you hit on so many important themes here. Um, you know, one of them being trust and trust in our leaders more broadly. Another being, you know, what happens with leaders when when they use humor effectively. Another being, you know, it used to be that leaders needed to be on a pedestal, needed to be revered, and they had all the answers. And now more so leaders need to be trusted. They need to be understood. They need to show signs of vulnerability. Um, there was a recent uh, study that 58% people of people would rather trust a stranger than their own boss. Uh, I mean, everyone on this call is definitely in the 42%, but that is a little bit uh, a little bit shocking. So, um, so in that context, what we find is that when people use humor authentically, or even when they laugh with others, when they laugh more generously, they enjoy more trust um, from their colleagues and from their direct reports. Um, people report that uh, if their leader has a sense of humor, then they are more respected. So this was one study that that found it asked the question. Um, does your does your boss have a sense of humor? So not are they funny, but just do they have a sense of humor? And um, in that study, uh, bosses who have a sense of humor were ranked as 27% more respected and also more competent and more confident. Um, we also find that employees uh, report being 27% more or 23% more motivated in their jobs when their boss is reported to have a sense of humor and that they are 15% more engaged. So, um, you know, so this is not just about us showing more of our humanity and being more trusting, although that's really important. It's also about creating the kind of environment and being the kind of leader that people are more willing to follow, people who are motivating, people who are trustworthy, um, people who keep their, their employees energized. Um, and more so we find that that showing your sense of humor at work is a really effective way to do that. Did you have anything you wanted to add on to that, Jennifer? No, I was just, um, I was thinking about, you know, basically this idea around um, how different humor styles show up for leaders. So one of the comments in the chat was, you know, giving, you know, more tangible examples of how humors, uh, how leaders use humor in these varied ways aligned with these very different ty types of styles. So I would say um, another example of this is when um, Ed Catmull, who has perhaps more of a sweetheart type of style, tends to be more earnest and, you know, kind of honest and super smart. And he, as you know, you know, led Pixar for many, many, many years. He wrote the foreword of our book too. But what you see with that kind of sweetheart style is that A, he's using humor in ways that kind of uplift but he's also empowering others to use it. And so one small example of that is, um, you know, he wrote the foreword of our, our, our book, as you know, and he talks a lot about humor, not as this kind of laugh ha ha thing, but as basically the best way to create meaning mm -hmm. to people on a very fundamental and emotional level. And at that, at that it, for, for sweethearts, when you authentically understand you know, your style and how it comes alive, it becomes very powerful. Um, the point that he made actually in our forward is that, you know, we all want meaning in our lives. And yet there's you know, all of these times we're living through with this global pandemic where life is very serious and very hard and very mundane and stressful at the same time. So having a sense of humor doesn't just punctuate and offset the seriousness, it allows the meaning to come through. Mm. So these unexpected moments with coworkers, like even Naomi's example with the CFO, um, you know, these unexpected moments can shake things up and keep you on your toes. And they define the shape of your relationship as much as these hard moments. So playfulness and bonding with another um, actually, you know, create meaning. And also in the case of like a sweetheart type of leadership style, allow you to kind of authentically use it. So if someone isn't, doesn't conceive of themselves as a natural comedian, right? Because not everybody does. Um, and I, some of the funniest people I've ever met are completely, you know, powder keg dry. I mean, they're really not, not, you know, big laugh people, but I, I love Naomi, the example in the book of you and the lady that was selling apples, I guess at the airport. 
Oh yeah. And, and just, you know, finding that moment that really changed a situation. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that moment was, uh, I was in an airport and it was totally mundane that by the way, this is a totally mundane story. So, but that's the point of it. So don't be mad at me that it's not a good story, but I mean, you know, I'm in the that's airport. Fine. I, think it's I, go to, I go to buy an apple from this, you know, airport bodega and I go to the front and um, ask if the apples are for sale. Cause they're these like waxy, gorgeous pyramid display of apples. So I go to the front and say, pardon me, are these for sale? And the woman behind the counter looks at me and goes, yeah, they're for sale. If you get in line, you know, like very, she was terse. She was already really frustrated with me. So I got to the back of the line and I just sort of watched her as she was interacting, which sounds creepy, but it, it was totally normal. I watched <laughs> her as she was interacting and she had probably had a really hard day. She was sort of snapping at all of the people in line. She was really terse. She had, you know, a furrowed brow and just looked like she was not having a good time. And so I got to the front of the line and when it was my turn to order, instead of saying, can I have an apple? I simply said, can I please have your favorite apple? And she looked at me like I was crazy and said, <laughs> what? And I said, well, there are a hundred apples down here. I would love to have your favorite apple. And there was this moment where it felt like just a, a speck of, um, of sparkle, like descended on the moment and just erupted. And in that moment she smiled and she went, okay. And she started looking through the, you know, the apples, you know, Fast forward 20 seconds, she's laughing. The people in line behind us are laughing. She's like inspecting all of them. And finally she gets her two favorite apples in front of her. She says, I think these are the two best. Which one do you want? And I said, I don't know. It's your favorite apple, not mine. <laughs> and so finally she, you know, she hands me her favorite apple. And, um, you know, at that point, um, the, the vibe had just totally changed. Right. So I go to check out and she said, that's okay. I don't, I don't charge for my favorite apple. Have a great day. <laughs> But that's lovely. And, you know, imagine multiplying that, especially now. I mean, one of the questions in the chat has been, you know, how has this pandemic affected you? I mean, and I know the fun of launching a book, you know, in the midst of this, right? Um, but, but I mean, I think anybody who's listening can really relate to that, right? I mean, you don't have to be, you know, a stand-up comic. You can add this this magical little moment to all of your interactions if you look for it, you know, if you look for it. That's right. And it's, it's the power of these moments in between, right? They're not the big moments that we think they are. They're the little moments in between where we're just navigating our lives on the precipice of a smile, trying to find ways to connect with each other as people, trying to find moments of humanity and moments where we can create a little bit of joy for someone else. Pandemic thoughts? Well, two things. One is that, you know, it's never been more important than right now to do this. You know, um, depression is on the rise. Anxiety has been on the rise. And um, what we know because of the neurochemical um, shifts that laughter and humor um, cause that there's real important physical benefits that um, happen when we have these shared laughter. Um, moments, you know, in a Norwegian study, um, you know, over 15 years, people that said that they had a sense of humor, and this is like a low bar, Norway, Norway yes. <laughs> um, you know, they actually were 30% more resistant to severe disease. Um, they lived eight years longer. And those are high quality eight years because of the humor cliff. Um, and so I, I, you know, one thing that was interesting, just like a personal anecdote, we haven't really shared this before, but, you know, Naomi and I, our book was supposed to come out October 6th and um, in the US and it came out October 8th in the UK, but it got moved back to February 2nd because the world that we're living in, in especially in the US, but globally is so uncertain and so hot, anxiety is so high. And we get that and we are, um, you know, we're grateful for it, but at the same time, what's been interesting is that there's been just this mad rush of interest in how do I infuse some levity in these small moments of our day and work? Um, and we need it now more than ever because you just, you're not going to be able to <laughs> last at this point. You know, there's not really a very super clear end in sight. So we have to change our mindset mm -hmm. and start to look for these moments appreciate 
the health benefits, the neurochemical benefits, the relationship benefits, and, and really prioritize it. Svetlana is going to hopefully explore a chief humor officer. Um, and if she does that, she's got to email us. I put in my personal email, Naomi will too, we'll send another email, but like, awesome. like, how do you really make that change happen in the world? You know, and if we can do that with others at scale uh, through companies, we would be, that would, that would be success for us. Mm -hmm. So we think it's important um, now more than ever. Absolutely. And I think the, the, the story you told earlier about people encouraging each other to think about like, what would be the best thing I would do like the day after I get released or the day after this is over or the day after we're liberated. And I'm almost thinking we should be thinking about um, helping people focus on those things, you know, once, once the world has sort of settled into whatever comes next. Um, and also there's some things that people have really enjoyed about this. I mean, it's, it's hard to be gleeful if you're, you know, economically in despair or waiting in a food line, but you know, the fact that you do have family and you do have people near you and that there's, there are things to be um, grateful for, you know, I think that's, that's, that's all kind of wrapped up there. Um, so one of the, um, interesting things about the book, and I'm just mindful of time, um, you, you actually talk about the construction of stories and the construction of, of humorous stories in, in your case, but storytelling more broadly. And um, uh, one of the things we've, we take away from our women in leadership class and some of the other courses I teach is human minds are very interesting. So we have this belief we tell ourselves that we evaluate the facts and we look at the data and we come to an informed rational decision and that's how we make decisions. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting old enough and cranky enough to believe that the exact opposite is true. We listen to stories, we listen to our gut, we hear whatever's the most appealing or amusing, and then we go look for the spreadsheets and the PowerPoints that support whatever position it is we've decided we wanted to take. Because I fundamentally think human beings are influenced by the story, that that's what grabs us first. And then maybe we find supporting facts and evidence. But just looking at, you know, 30 years of business history <laughs> would suggest we're not making fact-based data, uh, you know, data rich decisions. Um, so it's about the story, right? Yeah. It is, you know, story is 22 times more, up to 22 times more likely to be remembered than just facts alone. Um, that was work done by Gordon Bauer, you know, back in, you know, with, with a real focus on uh, cognitive development and memory um, and completely agree with you, Rita. I think that one thing that's really interesting um, about some of the work that Naomi and I have been able to do is that at a, a moment in time where digital transformation is really shifting and um, this idea of what does it mean to be human um, is, is more important now than, than ever. And story makes us human story captures and communicates and helps co-create meaning and and humor is another tool and um, that humor is one of the um the things that actually you know define us as humans for us to be able to read the room for us to know what makes us laugh um, those are those are things that are really at the opposite extreme of all of you know what's being developed from an ai machine learning perspective so as we think about things like story and humor um, and creativity more generally, I think that um, it's, it's important to kind of contextualize why it's so important. And also hopefully it underscores why um, we need to prioritize it. And, you know, in that context too, if we're just talking about memorability, there, there's a wealth of research that shows that humor makes makes things far more memorable. So I remember watching a State of the Union, um, I forget what year it was, but it was President Obama's State of the Union. And, you know, it's an hour long, hour long, uh, very content dense, content rich uh, talk. And during it, he, he told one little joke and uh, the joke, the, the laugh line on the joke was smoked salmon. You can Google his State of the Union smoked salmon. And I laughed and I thought, huh, that was like pretty good, not bad, right? But I didn't think much of it. Well, the next day NPR surveyed their listeners and they asked, um, they asked what were the words that you remembered most from the State of the Union? And of course, things like hope, change, economy, all these words came up. 
but far and away the most remembered word was salmon. <laughs> And this crossed political lines. So Republican listeners, Democratic listeners, independent listeners, the most remembered word from the entire thing was salmon. And even though this seems so silly and ridiculous, it really, it is wild how when we are, we are, we have, we're bar- we have a barrage of information coming at us all the time, right? So how do we parse the signal from the noise? One way is story and within story, humor can be a really powerful technique. Mm-hmm. I'm also intrigued at um, the the connection of this work to p- the work of people like Bob Cialdini, right? Who talks about how do you influence people? And a lot of his findings would would be consistent with yours. So, you know, we tend to be influenced by people who, th- who we think like us, right? And what better way than sharing an in-joke to, to, to create a sense of liking, right? Um, social proof, you know, we, we are influenced by people who we believe share similar uh, traits and attributes. Um, and I also think it's, um, it's, it's, again, just to, you know, anybody can do this, right? So one of my favorite stories is um, when I first started at Columbia, one of my colleagues um, is a gentleman by the name of Don Hambrick. And Don's a very serious scholar and you know, thousands of publications done all this work on CEOs and CEO lifestyles and everything. But, you know, he doesn't come across like a, like a comedian, like in any way, shape or form. So I'll never forget, I was, uh, when I was learning to teach this course, he graciously gave me permission to sit in on his sections. And we were talking about the, um, the importance of relative measures when constructing a survey. So like, are you asleep yet? Can I talk? Would you like to hear more about relative measures in constructing the <laughs> survey? So he's got to now convince his MBAs, right, that this is that this is something valuable. And so he sort of starts off, he says, well, relative measures in constructing a story. Imagine that I am on a desert island with a beautiful young woman, and I'm interested in uh, ascertaining her opinion of me. And so I reach into my bag and pull out the clipboard with which I am never without, and proceed to ask her a series of questions about how... <laughs> And the punchline was, you know, relative to my expectations, relative to other alternatives, like how, how well do I rate up? But I swear to God, there's an entire generation of MBA students now who will never forget that Don Hamburg, the image of Don Hamburg, like whipping this clipboard out of his bag at this very, you know, you know, big moment. Um, and so you can get away with it, you know, even if, even if you're not sort of naturally a, a humor sort of if that's not what you lead with, you know, you can do it for your own way. There was a question a little bit earlier um, about low, well, women and low power people and self-deprecation, right? And uh, that is something I think you have to be careful with. Um, I, I think, you know, if you tell a self-deprecating narrative, unfortunately, there are people who will agree with you <laughs> and buy into that. So I think maybe when you're in a low power position, and I'd be interested in your opinion, you, you want to be a little more careful about that. Absolutely. So in general, we find that when you're more senior, self-deprecation gets powerful. Women, though, tend to over-index on self-deprecation. And this is part of how we are um, social. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Did I did I say I was sorry? Did I say I was sorry enough? Oh, oh. No, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have talked. Jennifer, did you want to talk? Guys, I want. Oh, I'm sorry. Jennifer's talking better than me anyways. That I'm clip is going right. on Twitter. I swear to God. Sorry. What were you saying? <laughs> So I was saying that, um, oh, who knows anymore? I don't have good points anyways. Right, so what I was saying was that women really do tend to tend to over-index on self-deprecation. And it's partly because the way that we are socialized, right? So we're socialized to, you know, defer status to each other. Whereas little boys oftentimes on the playground engage in status matching. So they are, you know, they're one-upping each other. And so even though we women can feel, okay, great. We're in leadership roles. Now we can use self-deprecation. We also need to recognize that we are inclined to over-index on it. And so making sure that we are staying calibrated is one really important thing. And the other thing is making sure that we're not making jokes about our core competency. So we can make jokes about, you know, Uh, things that are unrelated to being the CFO or being the CEO, but it gets a little bit trickier and we want to be a little bit more careful when we're making jokes about our core competency. I had a great experience of this. So one of the clients I got invited to speak for was Vogue magazine. Now, I don't know about you guys, but like, I find that very intimidating. And so the night before this whole event takes place, um, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, and I'm normally pretty calm in these situations, but I'm like, and asking my husband, what do I wear? Like, do I go with the pearls and the this or do I do it or whatever? And he kind of looks up from his newspaper or whatever he happened to be doing it. And he said, Frida, I really don't think you should worry about it. They're not asking you for fashion advice. <laughs> 
and he was so right. It was like, oh, sure, I could go in wearing a burlap bag. That's not, you know, they don't care. <laughs> I mean, that wasn't why they invited me. So I just thought that was a very interesting illustration of this point that you make, which was, you know, my core competence would be strategic thinking and all that stuff. Not fashion. <laughs> Definitely not fashion. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, what should everybody listening do? Where can they find out more? How do we become part of your world more? Oh, become part of our world. Of course. Uh, Jennifer, I think these are me. These things, right? I live at 4007 Natasha. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so to become our best friend, what you really want to do is just go to Amazon or anywhere you shop books and buy two hardcover books right now because um, one for your best friend and one for you. And if you do, and you just email us at humor at hello, seriously.com. Hey, hold on. It's hello. It's hello at humor, seriously.com. Shit. Damn it. Hello. You said, you said humor at hello, seriously.com. Our next wonderful. book is our I next think book. You should is get gonna, that email address. You should totally get that email address. <laughs> our next book is going to be hello, seriously. And it's all about how people say, hello in different ways across the world in, in, in somber, with so, with somber, you know, tone. Indeed. Indeed. And, but before you do that, <laughs> please, please instead go to hello at humor .com, which I typed in the chat. Okay. And if you buy a couple of a hard copy books, it would go so far and please do just email us. And we have like lots of, as Rita intimated, um, lots of little bonus gifts. Um, plus, are you our, gonna do Christmas? Are you going to do the holiday thing? We're going to do a holiday thing too. Oh. So, um, yeah. So, one thing we're we're doing is for every individual that buys one or two books, and you don't even need to give us the receipt. We trust you. Just like tell us you did. Um, we're actually doing a matching for um, of books that we're buying with a sponsor for um, three charities. One is Merit America, really focused on taking people that have very little means right now and getting them jobs. Two is um, Eat, Learn, Play, which is an incredible charity focused on helping kids eat, learn, and play. And so these will go to teachers um, that are helping these students. And then the third thing is um, we are giving to county jail. So Naomi and I have actually done work in different ways in different jails. And um, and so we're gonna try and focus on that. So that's our matching situation. And then we also have little tips and tricks that we'd love to share with you. And you got some download things and of course the, the holiday thing. So, I mean, I don't know about you, but um, I have I, I have a lot of people in my like gift list who really don't need more stuff. So something that would bring a smile would be a wonderful, wonderful thing for them. <laughs> so that would be great. All right. Um, well, this this just flew by. Um, it's really it such a pleasure uh, to to be with you. Um, go order books. Go 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 do it. Um, and uh, we'll we'll keep on touch. And so the big date in the U.S. is when February third. February second, and then but it's out. I saw that E Kumar's in India right now. And well, you know, even if you aren't, you can go to humorseriously.com on the UK Amazon website and get it now for 15 bucks. And we should mention that we are doing part of the holiday promotion is that anyone who buys a hardcover book to be delivered in February, we're giving early um, access to a digital edition oh, nice. that you can um, download to your Kindle. And of course, you can gift that to everyone you know.